Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Norman, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Thank you all for taking the time of your weekend to join us this morning. We have some exciting and informative talks lined up for you. So without much further ado, uh, we'd like to start with the welcome address. Uh, Professor Tan, unfortunately, will not be able to join us today as he's caught up with some emergency surgeries. Uh, so I'll be doing the welcome address on his behalf. So today our webinar is about how to keep our colon healthy in the pandemic. Next. Looking at the cancer registry over the past 50 years, actually we can really see that in men, colorectal cancer ranks number one, and in females, colorectal cancer is number two. However, across the board, colorectal cancer is still the number one disease uh, in, this can in this cancer registry. In 2020, in a Less than 50% of Singapore residents aged 50 to 74 years have undergone colorectal cancer screening within the recommended screening frequency. A quarter of these residents actually re reported having undergone the fecal or cow blood test at least once in the past year, and a qu another quarter had undergone colonoscopy. So the practice of taking a fecal or cow blood test or colonoscopy was more prevalent among males compared to females. In the clinical practice guidelines published by MOH, we can see that they strongly recommend for colorectal cancer screening because it improves survival. And in average age individuals, we recommend for screening to begin at the age of 50 years old. For individuals with increased risk or high risk, colonoscopy is actually strongly recommended. And the age at which screening should be started should be discussed with your colorectal surgeon. So I will not hold up uh, the rest of the other speakers' time. Uh, introduce the next speaker, Professor Chon Chun Singh. He's a senior consultant at NUH Colorectal Surgery, and he's here to answer our queries about colorectal cancer screening. Professor Chong, please. Hi, can, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Good morning and thanks, Norman. Uh, good to see you all on a Saturday morning and uh, very happy to be here with my esteemed colleagues to talk about if you feel well, do you need to be screened? Well, what is screening? It really just means uh, going for a test when you have no symptoms. And uh, it sounds unusual, but a lot of people actually do ask why. If I feel well, why do I need to go for any test? Doesn't that mean I'm healthy? But well, the truth is, uh, based on like what uh, my previous speaker spoke about, is colorectal cancer is a very common disease. And you can see that it affects many ages, especially if you're 50 and above. And truly, it is something that you should go for screening. Reason number one, it is indeed the most common cancer in Singapore. And in fact, uh, in our practice, uh, we see a lot of patients with colorectal cancer, and it is always best to detect diseases when they're early. If you look at the statistics, 15 Singaporeans die of cancer every day. And amongst those diagnoses, you know, one in every six cancer diagnoses is a colorectal cancer. Beyond commonality, the other real main reason why you should go for screening is early cancer has no symptoms. I tell this all the time to my patients, is this truth? Without any pain or even any bleeding when you pass motion, it doesn't mean you are free from cancer. And, and it really boils down to the fact that when cancer is early, when it's a small volume disease, when there's just one little polyp in your colon, you're not going to be able to detect it just by asking questions alone. And so by going for some kind of test, it allows us to detect cancers early and it will just allow us to actually treat the patients in the early stage of cancer. If you look at the picture here, something like a normal colon and versus some, uh, the picture on the right where you have a polyp there, it's not going to give you much difference in terms of the symptoms. You will feel well, you will feel comfortable, you have no pain, and you probably don't even feel like you need to see a doctor. 
However, this is the basis of screening, where if you have no symptoms, you should see a doctor, especially if you're 50 years and above, to go for a check. This slide tells us a lot about who are the patients with cancer and you can really not tell who has cancer. And in fact, it's not just you. We, as doctors and surgeons, cannot tell who has cancer. And you can have patients like this. You might know the, the patient on the right. He's a, he's a famous actor and we may have all seen his movies. And the truth is he's diagnosed with a stage 4 advanced colorectal cancer. And nobody could even tell by looking at the movies or whether it's on screen or even look at his interviews. And we, unfortunately, we still see patients who like, that, like this, that when it's time to find out about their conditions, it is often too late. So what are the benefits? Early detections means a few things to us. Number one, it means the ease of treatment. If a cancer like this picture that is shown, for one of the patients where we can pick up a cancer like this, all you need is maybe just treatment from the scope. By putting an endoscopy in the colon, you could just simply remove this without needing any further therapy, even surgery. And that really makes a lot of difference. Not just the very fact that we can pick up the cancer, but we could treat cancer when it's an early stage makes a whole lot of difference to the patient's outcome and outlook in life. What else does it mean? Early detection also means better prognosis. If you see from a stage zero to a stage four kind of cancer, it's really a progression from a small polyp or little growth to a more aggressive and invasive type of growth that goes beyond the confines of the intestine. And when we remove the growth, when it's still confined within the intestine or just in the region, then the overall prognosis or so-called the outlook is much, much better. And so it is, of course, uh, better for us where we diagnose the condition when it's on the stage one or even better. When we say stage zero, it means that it is pre-invasive, commonly turned as polyps, but again, there are many types, but it is a polyp that hasn't changed to a cancer. And that's really the one of the greatest benefit, it is that scopes or screening can prevent colorectal cancer. And this is the last point. Prevention really looks like this. If you look at this polyp here, it is something that is pre-invasive. It has not gone into the deeper layers of the intestine. And you can see that there is an instrument there. Uh, it is white in color. It is basically something that we use to put around the polyp. And after you remove it, it's gone. And such measures allow us to prevent the, even the formation of cancer before, uh, when, when, before the polyp grows to something bigger and deeper. And so if you're convinced that, number one, we can't tell who has cancer and you know that it's a common cancer and there are so many benefits, then the next simple question is, how does any one of us get screened? Well, simple. These are the two main ways that screening for colorectal cancer is encouraged in Singapore. On the left, it's a fecal uh, test. It's basically sending a stool sample of yours and get it checked. And that actually can come very conveniently. It's easily achievable or uh, you can take it from polyclinics, pharmacies. You can, you can even uh, take it from uh, Singapore Colorectal Center, uh, the, the yeah, Watsons and Guardians tanks, as well as uh, going to Health Promotion Board. And it comes free and you send off the test and, and you get the test mailed to you, the results mailed to you. The second way to do it is going through a colonoscopy. For that, you just need to see a doctor who can refer you to either any, any hospitals. And this is a procedure that's safe and is very commonly done as well as very effective. And that will not just allow us to check for cancer, but like I said, it can help us to check for a pre-cancer phase and we can remove it before it becomes cancer. When then should I get started? As I explained, the cancer incidence really rises after the age of 50 years old. So if you're about the age of 50 and above, that's really the start age that you should get screened for. However, if you do have any symptoms or if you have any family history of cancer in your family, then you should go and see a doctor 
and get advice about should you get screening started earlier than 50 or could you just stay at 50 still? And I think with that, that will be my last slide here. This is about other patients who might have an increased risk. Like if you ever had a scope done before and you had polyps before, then it also depends on what kind of polyp you have and you might have to get an earlier scope as well. You might have to have a repeat scope done in about three to five years. Likewise, if you have a lot of relatives who has cancer as well as not just colorectal cancer, but ovary cancer or colorectal related cancers, it is best for you to get an advice from a doctor to see whether you need to start screening earlier. With that, I have done my talk. Thank you again for the time to share this information with you. I hope it helps you. And hopefully, you will be encouraged to go for screening even when you do not have any symptoms. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. We come to the poll question. <laughs> uh, it's just for a question for us to see whether uh, if this helps you to understand what I've just said. So I will just read off the question and hopefully uh, I would like to see everyone's response to see which of the statements are false. So which of the following statement is false? There's one particular statement of these four choices is actually false. The first one is early detection can prevent colorectal cancer. The second one is early detection can help with the ease of treatment. The third one is early detection can speed up the surgery. And last but not least, early detection can mean a better prognosis. So we see that most of you all have voted for either number one or three. And we can also, okay, shall we just share the results? I think, oh, thank you so much. There has been a lot of replies. So generally, early detection, we understand it can prevent colorectal cancer. So that's not false. It can help with the ease of treatment. As you mentioned, it's a small guy. You can just sometimes even remove it from the scope. And it definitely means a better prognosis. Early detection doesn't speed up the surgery. Of course, when we detect the cancer early, we can then plan for the surgery. But really, if you talk about the ease of treatment, if you talk about the prognosis, this is where screening really comes off. Thank you so much for your time again. Thank you, Professor Chong. Next, we have Dr. Bettina Liske, Senior Consultant of NUH Colorectal Surgery. She will be answering some myths related to colorectal cancer. Dr. Bettina, please. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to uh, get into the uh, MythBuster segment, and we'll start with the uh, colorectal cancer edition, and then one of my colleagues will take you through some, some more myths later. So um, there's one question that really bugs me, uh, and particularly after just listening into um, my colleague's talk, why is it that despite proven, affordable, effective screening methods, people choose to risk an emergency surgery that is possibly life-ending and very likely life-altering? I think some of the reasons might be the following. And these are the myths that we will be looking at this morning. Myth number one, colonoscopies are painful, dangerous, and expensive. Myth number two, elective cancer surgery is as dangerous as an emergency operation. Myth number three, colon cancer is incurable. Myth number four, colon cancer surgery results in major complications. Let's have a look at them in turns. First of all, the colonoscopy screening. As we've already heard just now, a screening colonoscopy is recommended from the age 50 onwards in everybody who has no symptoms. And that means really everybody just by age alone. It is a day surgery procedure, which is done under sedation. And you can even save it, you can even claim it from your MediSafe account. A colonoscopy is the gold standard for complete large bowel evaluation, which means that we can really see everything inside your colon when we do this procedure. We are actually not looking for cancers during this. We are looking for the precancerous polyps that were mentioned earlier. Polyps are very common. One in four people age 50 and above have a polyp that can be found during colonoscopy. That means 25% of people who go for a colonoscopy will have a polyp detected. 
Complications during colonoscopy, however, are very rare. This is one to two in over a thousand procedures that we do. I've put you the risk in percentage there to just show you that it is really very, very small. The good thing about polyps that we find is that they can get removed during the procedure itself and sent for analysis. And most of the time they turn out to be a polyp that is not even a cancer yet. If we do find polyps, we usually ask you to come back for another colonoscopy about three to five years later to check whether there have any more polyps grown in the meanwhile. And again, we can take them out. What happens if we do find a cancer during the colonoscopy? As we've already heard, colon cancer is quite common. One in 16 people will develop a cancer in their colon over a lifetime. That is about five to six percent. It is the commonest cancer in Singapore overall, and we see in excess of 1,200 cases every year. Screen detected cancers are usually very small, early stage, and curable. It is more likely to find a precancerous polyp than a cancer during a screening colonoscopy. And that means up to 85% of colorectal cancers could be prevented or successfully treated if everyone who is eligible for colonoscopy gets screened. So in summary, if everybody goes for a colonoscopy, around 20 to 25% of people will have a polyp removed. Around 75% of people will have a completely normal colonoscopy. Less than 5% will have an early stage curable cancer diagnosed. So colonoscopies can both detect and prevent cancers. One day of inconvenience for peace of mind for most people for the next five to 10 years. That's pretty good odds. Let's move on to myth number two. Elective cancer surgery is as dangerous as an emergency operation. Let me show you a picture what it looks like when somebody goes for an elective resection, which you can see here. It is a planned surgery for most cancers found on colonoscopy. There is usually a preoperative visit to speak to the surgeon, the anesthetist, an enhanced recovery nurse, a dietitian, to plan your operation, and this is all done during office hours in good time. There will be a scheduled admission, you know when you're coming in, and a planned operating slot, all during daytime hours. Most surgery, as you can see here, is done by keyhole, which results in small scars, less pain, and a lot faster recovery. Let's have a look at an emergency resection in comparison. It is usually an unplanned surgery on an admission with an emergency, which is either a blockage of the bowel, which we call an obstruction, or a rupture of the bowel, which is called a perforation. There's very little time to plan as most patients are very unwell. It will be the next available slot in the emergency operating theater, and that is usually after office hours. It results in a large incision, a big wound, high risk of complications, and a very high risk of ending up with a stoma bag. Emergency resections often result in complications further down the line. I don't want to scare you off, but the mortality rate associated with an emergency colorectal surgery for an acute blockage of the bowel is between 15 to 20%. The rate of complications is between 40 and 50%. That means half of all people who go for an emergency surgery will have some form of complication. Sometimes we need to do the surgery in stages with repeated trips to the operating theater. It commonly requires an intensive care unit stay. It results in a long hospital stay and need for rehabilitation afterwards and often results in a stoma. The picture you see here on the side is one of our patients who had to undergo such a procedure. You can see a bit mid midline scar with a wound dressing on it, and then on the side you can see the stoma bag. These wounds take a long time to heal. This is a picture of a wound about six to eight weeks later. It is still not completely healed, although it's definitely getting a lot better. If we do an emergency resection, often this results in a stoma. Because there's little time to plan for the surgery, there is most likely no stoma nurse available to counsel, plan, and mark for the stoma during, off, during the uh, time that this needs to be done because it's after office hours. So there's a higher risk of the stoma ending up in an inconvenient location, such as a skin crease, as you can see in the picture above, and a higher risk of stoma complications resulting from this, such as leakage, retraction, or poor healing, especially in those patients who have come into a hospital with a complication 
of already having had a blocked bowel and not having been eaten for quite some time. An emergency resection doesn't only lead to short-term outcomes that are worse, but it also leads to longer uh, cancer outcomes being worse. Cancers are twice as likely more advanced in emergency presentations compared to elective presentations. They're almost twice as likely to have metastatic disease, meaning spread to other areas at the presentation. And the five-year overall survival and disease-free survival, even for those cancers who are not spread, are worse when they come in with an obstruction, as you can see here. This is the patient who has gone under, under emergency operation and has now healed up. And you can see the stoma on the side there. So in summary, if we're looking at an elective versus an emergency surgery, despite many countries having a colorectal cancer screening program, the rate of emergency presentation remains relatively high. About 10 to 30% of patients overall with colorectal cancers present as an emergency and not as an elective planned operation. And there is definitely an association between an emergency presentation of colorectal cancer and significantly worse short and long-term outcomes. So let's move on to myth number three. Colorectal cancer is incurable. Actually, it is not. If we're looking at the five-year relative survival rate, and that means the likelihood of surviving when compared to a normal population, we are looking at pretty good odds for stage one and stage two cancers here. And those really are the screen detected ones. An early stage detected cancer going for some treatment has got a good result in long-term prognosis. So they are not incurable. How do we cure it? Stage one needs surgery alone. Stage two needs surgery alone unless it was an emergency. And then we'll discuss the chemotherapy. If we're looking at stage three and above, the patients are usually advised to have some chemotherapy. So again, stage one and two are the ones that we detect when we do the colonoscopies. In summary, detecting cancers at an early stage and then surgically removing them allows to cure. Early stage cancers do not even require chemotherapy for cure. Oops. So if we're looking at myth number four, colon cancer results, colon cancer surgery results in major complications. Elective resection, as we discussed previously, allows us planning and preparation, often as a same day admission. Stomas are very uncommon. The risk of wound infection is around 5%. And that is in comparison to the previous, almost half of patients will get some form of complications. There is a program that we run here in NUH, which is enhanced recovery after surgery. And that means we really make an effort to get you through the surgery and through the post-operative recovery quite fast. Average length of stay, especially in keyhole surgeries, is about five to six days. And most importantly, your bowel function usually returns to normal within a few months. So this is our colorectal, this is our surgical department in NUH. Sorry, they're not all colorectal surgeons. I didn't put this picture up here to show you who the colorectal surgeons are and whom you should come and see if you have a, an issue with your colon. The reason why I put this up is because one of these surgeons had colon cancer. This person was treated here in this unit. The question to you, can you tell which one it is? Actually looking at them from the outside, you can't. I can tell you it's not one of the last lines because those are the junior residents. <laughs> so the question that still bugs me, why is it that despite proven affordable effective screening methods, people still choose to risk an emergency surgery that is possibly life ending and very likely life altering? I'm really not very sure but it literally keeps us awake at night. Thank you very much for your attention. Very happy to answer any questions. The poll. <laughs> okay, let's move on and see um, which of the following statements is true for colorectal cancer. I'll give you a little bit of time to answer this. So colorectal cancer is curable. Colorectal cancer cannot be prevented. Colon polyps are cancerous and require surgery. Planned colorectal surgery has a high risk of complications. Thank you very much for participating. It's really heartening to see that you're really into this.
I can see the bar still moving. Keep going. You are doing great. <laughs> Okay, great. So thank you very much. I think we'll stop the poll there. Um, the correct answer, which of the following is true for colorectal cancer is that colorectal cancer definitely is curable. So thank you for taking the time to answer this. Um, do we have another question? Just the one. Okay, great. I hand the time back to Norman to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bettina. Lastly, we have Dr. Gloria Chan. Associate Consultant with the Department of uh, NUH Hematology Oncology. She will be addressing some myths related to chemotherapy for colorectal cancer. Dr. Gloria, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Gloria, one of the medical oncologists at NSYS, and um, I have a special interest in colorectal cancer as well as cancer genetics. So today we'll discuss and maybe debunk or even confirm some of the common myths that you may have heard about colorectal cancer. So in this information age, when you can find anything on the dark web, I find it most appropriate that the theme for today's talk during Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month is Mythbusters. So there is a wealth of information or maybe misinformation out there. In fact, a Google search for the term colorectal cancer will yield 29 million results. So let's start off with some basic definitions. What is colorectal cancer? So the colon is the longest part of the large intestines and it connects the small intestine to the, at one end and the anus at the other. Its main function is for digestion. It absorbs water, electrolytes and substances from uh, partially digested food. The rectum is the last part of the large intestine closest to the anus and its main function is to store stools until evacuation happens. So now that we know what uh, the colon and rectum are, then Cancer is a disease in which some of the body cells uh, grow uncontrollably and has the potential to spread to other parts of the body. Uh, cancer starts from a single cell um, in, a, uh, in the inner layer of the colon. So normally cells grow and divide to make new cells as the body needs them. Um, in fact, the cells in the colon are constantly being replaced as the old cells die when they get old or damaged and the new cells take um, uh, when the new cells um, yeah, and the new cells take their place. So uh, the division and growth of cells in our body are actually very um, regulated and is controlled by a very uh, tight process. And cancer begins when genetic changes interfere with this orderly process. The cells can start to grow uncontrollably. And uh, the, these cells form a mass called a tumor. So one common question that I get asked is, um, is my cancer benign or malignant? So suffice to say that the term cancer refers to a malignant tumor, and this means that it can grow and potentially spread to other parts of the body. Broadly speaking, benign tumors can grow, but will not spread. Okay, so um, let's get on to the myths regarding colon cancer, and we'll start with the myths surrounding colon cancer prevention. So the first myth being, I'm very healthy. Um, many patients always meet the diagnosis of cancer with disbelief, and many of them tell me this. I feel fine, I'm very healthy, I eat well, walk 10,000 steps a day, how can I get cancer? So the truth is, um, as Norman uh, Chun Singh and Bettina mentioned earlier, that colorectal cancer is the number one cancer in Singapore in males and females combined. And among, amongst men, it is the most common cancer. Um, in, in women is second after breast cancer. And over the last 50 years or so, we see the trend of lung cancer decreasing in men and with increased awareness about risk of smoking and whatnot and, there's, uh, and the rise of colon cancer. In Singapore, there have been more than 11,000 new diagnoses of colorectal cancer between the years of 20, 2014 to 2018. The lifetime risk of getting colon cancer is about one in 23. This means that um, it will be unsurprising that we know at least one person with colon cancer diagnosed um, at some point of time. So um, what then are the risk factors for colorectal cancer? So these are the inev inevitable things, things that we cannot change. So as we get older, the cells lining our colon, we mentioned earlier, would have gone through the process of regeneration many more times. So the DNA damage can occur and accumulate over time and increase the risk of colon cancer. 
becomes as no surprise then that age is a risk factor for colon cancer. Um, someone with a heart attack before will have higher chance of getting a heart attack in the future. Likewise, those with personal history of polyps and colon cancer will also have an increased risk of colon cancer. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD for short, such as ulcerative colitis, is a known risk factor for colon cancer, and patients with these conditions will undergo colonoscopy more frequently. Um, if you have a relative with a history of colon cancer, the risk of colorectal cancer is increased by twofold compared to the general population. The age recommended to start colon cancer screening depends on the age of the youngest family member diagnosed. Um, and inherited cancer syndromes, although they are rare, um, these occur when there are faulty genes that we might be born with that increase our risk of cancer. Also, some studies have shown that diabetes is an independent risk factor for colorectal cancer and has been linked to higher levels of insulin in the body. So then um, let's talk about what we can change. So the modifiable risk factors. There are you probably have uh, plenty of well-meaning friends or colleagues that may tell you about random supplements to take to reduce the risk of colon cancer. And patients often ask me if uh, this is true. And over the next few slides, we will discuss about what we can change to know about what can be done about reducing our risk for colorectal cancer. But it can really be summarized to these simple things, eating healthy, exercising, watching alcohol intake, not smoking, and attending health screenings regularly. So, the truth is that certain diets do increase the risk of cancer. And according to a statement put out by WHO in 2020, processed meats such as bacon, sausages, ham, beef jerky, whatnot, um, other smoked and cured meats increases the risk of colorectal cancer. Um, the numbers that have been given, it will be 50 grams of processed meat consumed per day over a, a prolonged period of time increases the relative risk of colorectal cancer by about 16%. So the data was definite enough to classify these processed meats as a group one carcinogen, which actually puts them in the same category as asbestos, smoking and alcohol. But of course, the risk is nowhere near the same. Red meat, including beef, pork, lamb, has also been shown to increase the risk of colorectal cancer as well. Um, that being said, the absolute risk increment is small and occurs only with heavy and daily consumption. The current guidelines of maintaining a healthy balanced diet, restricting weight and processed meats to one to two times weekly is acceptable. Pre the previous reported health benefits of a glass of red wine have most likely been overstated. The most recent guidelines put out by various international oncology societies identifies alcohol as an established risk factor for colorectal cancer, as well as several other cancers. So, um, you know, there are many other patients who also ask me, what about fiber, what about folic acid, vitamin B, vitamin D, calcium, dairy products, what about garlic, what about fish, what about coffee? So there have been multiple studies actually to look at the relationship of all these various foods with colorectal cancer. And suffice to say is that there isn't enough evidence to really conclude that any of these items can significantly reduce your risk of cancer. So um, the other truth is that exercise can reduce the risk of cancer. And it seems so simple that it tends to be understated. But the truth is often simple. There's well-established evidence that exercise reduces the risk of colon cancer, as well as at least six other cancers. Rather than looking into rare elixirs that do not exist, this is one really easy and cheap way that we can reduce our risk of cancer, not to mention many other diseases. The suggestion is for at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise throughout the week. Moderate intensity means that you need to aim to increase your heart rate to about 65 to 75% of your maximum heart rate. And high intensity means that you need to aim for at least 75 to 90%. Basically, in our climate, you must expect to be sweating. Walking around in the mall does not increase your heart rate and does not qualify as exercise. So for cancer survivors as well, physical activity lowers the risk of death. So just because you've been diagnosed with cancer doesn't mean that you have to be sedentary, regardless of the cause, whether it's from cancer or other diseases. Multiple studies have also shown that for cancer survivors, exercise has a beneficial impact on fatigue as well as quality of life. So we'll move on to our next myth, which is I am too young to get colon cancer. 
So certainly we've heard that the screening age for colorectal cancer starts at, starts at age 50. Um, because 90% of colorectal cancer actually occurs in those aged more than 50 years old. But that means that 1 in 10 of colon cancers are diagnosed under 50 years old. And this is seen to be on the rise. A recent study conducted in the US actually shows that 73% of patients, um, of these young patients were diagnosed at stage 3 or 4. So they tend to be diagnosed at a later stage. And this is not surprising because young patients may ignore their symptoms and their bodies are fit and they can compensate and be present later. Also, um, cancer may not be on the top of a physician's differentials when a very young person visits the doctor, and rightly so, so misdiagnosis can occur. Um, you may he have heard of Chapman Boswick, the actor famous for movies like Black Panther, who's diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer age 39. His cancer recurred and unfortunately passed away at age 43. So I think importantly, we need to pay attention to our own bodies and seek help if we notice any of the red flags, including um, anemia, rectal bleeding, change in bowel habits, persistent pain or discomfort, unexplained weight loss. It really helps also if you know your family history of cancer. It can help your doctor decide at what age should you commence colorectal cancer screening. So another th truth is that colon cancer in young patients are associated with inherited cancer genetic syndromes. Increasingly, there are many gene testing platforms that are direct to consumer, marketed on social media. You may have heard of some of them. Many of these companies have superstars and influencers to advertise for them. Um, you may have tested yourself or you may have heard someone who, who has undergone these testing. So perhaps we should try to understand a little bit more about inherited cancers. So in our bodies, we have more than 25,000 genes. Our genes determine what we look like, how our body functions. Some genes are responsible for our hair color, our skin color, our eye color. And some genes work to protect us against cancer. We all have two copies of each gene, one inherited from our father and one from our mother. If one of the two genes that protect us against colorectal cancer is not working, then our risk of colorectal cancer is increased. So the commonest colorectal cancer protection genes, I'll just name some. These are just the names, you don't really have to know. MLH1, MSH2, so on and so forth. Um, and if the damage to the cancer protection genes will increase our colon cancer risk by tenfold or more. So uh, the commonest uh, cancer genetic syndrome in colorectal cancer is Lynch syndrome. And um, it's, a, it's a condition whereby a mutation is found in one of the cancer protection genes. And it can pa be passed down from one generation to the next. But importantly, they only make up 5 to 10% of all colon cancers, which means that 95% of colon cancer are not due to inborn genetic um, problems. Sporadic cancers can still uh, are referred to those that occur due to aging, environment, diet, smoking, etc. Since they make up such a small minority of colon cancers, genetic testing is not offered to everyone diagnosed. Your doctor may suggest it if there is colon cancer diagnosed in a young patient, if there are many members in the family with colon cancer, or if there's a cluster of cancers in a particular family. In these cases, genetic testing is helpful because it can help identify um, the members who are at risk and we can recommend enhanced surveillance to them, different from those in the general population, and so as to help us diagnose pre-cancer or early stage cancers. So earlier we've heard Dr. Bettina talk about the myths of um, surrounding colon cancer surgery. So I'd like to address some of the common misconceptions of chemotherapy. So broadly speaking, there are several situations in colorectal cancer where we would suggest chemotherapy. So your oncologist may discuss this with you after your operation for colon cancer. In early stage disease, we do consider chemotherapy for some patients with stage two disease if they are we, what we think to be high risk and definitely for those with stage three cancer. So patients frequently ask, why do I need colorectal cancer? Uh, why do I need chemotherapy if my cancer has already been removed? So sometimes there may be cancer cells that have escaped into the bloodstream and um, these cells are too small to be detected on imaging. So the purpose of chemotherapy would be to kill the cells that may be present in the bloodstream to reduce the chance of cancer recurrence. In rectal cancer, sometimes um, we give it with radiotherapy to improve the effects of radiotherapy. Um, in advanced stage cancer, so about 25% of us um, of colon cancers are presented as stage four. 
And in, in stage four disease, um, in those patients who may undergo surgery, so if they're suitable for resection, we may sometimes consider chemotherapy to um, help downsize the chemo, uh, the, help downsize the cancer and to improve surgical outcomes. And of course, sometimes when the spread of cancer is too extensive and surgery is not possible, then chemotherapy will be helpful to control the disease, improve the symptoms of cancer, and prolong patients' lives. So with this understanding of the benefits of chemotherapy, we can address our next myth, which is, I will suffer from many side effects of our chemotherapy. So the truth is that um, every medication, whether we're talking about chemotherapy or not, has their side effects. And chemotherapy has an unfortunately very poor reputation due in part to what we may see on television. It is true that there are many side effects associated with chemotherapy, but I think that what is not highlighted is that there will be supportive medications that will be prescribed with chemotherapy to prevent and manage these side effects. So the side effects of chemotherapy really depends on the type of drugs that we use and um, how, how the fitness of our patients. So side effects commonly used for uh, the side effects that are um, patients commonly have uh, for those with colorectal cancer are usually mild and short-lived. And we usually prescribe things like anti-diarrhea, anti-nausea, moisturizing creams to help with these very common side effects. In fact, patients on chemotherapy also have dedicated cancer nurses who they can reach out to via telephone if they need help with their symptoms or just to support them through the journey. Just to, so to know that even if there are side effects on chemotherapy, they are often mild, they are usually temporary, and help is available. So many patients reject chemotherapy due to the fear of side effects. Um, maybe they have heard like their parents suffered while well, on chemotherapy more than 20 years ago. The truth is there's so much research that has gone into um, cancer treatment. And also there has been a lot of research that has been gone into uh, management of side effects. And the management of side effects now are much better compared to what we know from 20 years ago. I mean, one common side effect that patients um, are, may be concerned about would be uh, hair loss. So not all chemotherapy causes hair loss. And even if they do cause hair loss, 100% of all patients have their hair go back after chemotherapy. So we'll talk a little bit about prognosis. Um, it's generally a touchy subject and it's very difficult to address it without any context. So before discussing prognosis, I think it's important to know that every patient is different and every cancer is different. We cannot predict what will happen for the patient in front of us, but we can share data based on the information we have about the outcomes of the tens of thousands of similar patients that have had the same similar disease. So in true diagnosis of cancer still has a lot of stigma to this day. Some patients uh, do, do not like to talk about it because of uh, this fear. And some people do, don't like to openly discuss the diagnosis or treatment with their families. Um, I've heard cancer being referred to as the C word, that tumor, that thing and you know, not wanting to call chemotherapy, chemotherapy. So we understand that receiving news of any medical diagnosis can be scary and even more so if it is cancer. But I think it is important to call it what it is. Being able to talk openly about it, um, about what we know and what our next steps will be will really help remove the cloud of mystery and fear that always shrouds cancer. Um, and we already know that colon cancer is common. So all these famous people here were diagnosed with colorectal cancer, and many of them continued with their daily lives while battling cancer. So we know the famous actor who was um, filming movies throughout his chemotherapy and surgeries. And other famous people who battled colon cancer included the 40th president of the United States of America, Ronald Reagan, uh, the very talented Audrey Hepburn, um, English football captain uh, Bobby Moore, who won England only World Cup, and Brazilian soccer god Pelé. Uh, the creator of Peanuts, uh, Snoopy, you might know, are some of the famous people who have had colon cancer. So the truth is there is a silver lining. Survival rates are improving even in later stage disease. It is heartening to know that there are more than 1 million colon cancer survivors in the U US currently. So we are not in this alone. As a cancer specialist, I find it exciting that has been so much progress made in colorectal cancer over the years. As you can see on the graph on the right, cancer outcomes are improving due to improvements in treatment as well as prevention. 
So back in the 80s, the tenure, the tenure survival rate for colon cancer throughout all stages was less than 20%. It improved to 40% when I started medical school and is now close to more than 60% in recent times. This is across all stages. So, um, and since this infographic was made, actually there have been many, many more groundbreaking trials and more drugs that have been approved for use in colon cancer. So in summary, I think these are my take home messages. So you've heard so many things about colorectal cancer today. Hopefully we've become more aware. It is after all uh, colorectal cancer awareness month. And um, the, in summary, I think we, we have been uh, singing the same song. Colon cancer is common and we know how to deal with it. Colon cancer screening saves lives. Uh, prevention is better than cure. It's only a cliche because it's true. If you're smoking, stop. If you're not, don't start. And the benefits of wine are probably overstated. The best advice is to avoid if possible. And uh, relaxing the measures to serve alcohol beyond 10.30 p.m. is probably good from a COVID-19 easing of restriction point of view, but probably no good for cancer. Uh, eat healthy, so limit your uh, intake of red meat and processed meat. Aim for at least 150 minutes of exercise a week. It's great because we don't have to wear masks outdoors anymore. Uh, if you have symptoms, do not ignore them. Talk to your GP. Uh, treatment is effective. Regarding overall outcomes, we are definitely trending in the right direction and more work is being done to overcome cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. So we just have to test your knowledge with one more question. <laughs> So the question is, uh, which of the following puts an individual at a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer? So is it uh, eating processed meat daily, drinking alcohol heavily, smoking heavily, or having an inherited like, inborn colorectal cancer syndrome? Hey, I think most people who want to answer have answered. So the answer is actually number four. So having an inherited colorectal cancer syndrome does uh, significantly increase your risk of, um, of colorectal cancer. And in some cases, even close to tenfold. Uh, processed meat, alcohol, smoking. Um, uh, processed meat and alcohol increases the risk by less than twofold. So now for the highlight of this webinar, the Q&A segment, please feel free to ask your questions. I have seen some questions have been flowing around already and we have answered them uh, throughout the course of this webinar so far, but uh, keep them coming. We will try and answer as much as we can. And uh, so you can actually ask the questions by typing it in the chat box. Uh, if anybody has similar questions, you can upvote this question and uh, the more upvotes will probably be the more popular questions and we will try to address them. There is a question to Dr. Bettina. Uh, could you please elaborate on treatment for stage four cancer spread to lungs and liver? I think Dr. Bettina can, uh, can pair up with Dr. Gloria to try and answer this question. Yeah, I th thank you for the question. I think um, I, I said we would answer this live because Gloria was giving her talk. And um, I think Gloria um, might be um, in a better position to, to, to answer this. Maybe this question has been clarified uh, already during the, 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 the talk, but I think maybe we can just go into it and, and try and, and um, elaborate a bit, bit more on this. Yeah, so earlier we mentioned that stage four colorectal cancer, um, we do select very carefully which sort of patients that surgery will um, be helpful for. So why, why do we call it stage four colorectal cancers? Because um, there's actually a spread from the primary tumor um, to a distant organ. So in your case, you're asking about liver and the lung. Um, and the only way that the tumor can actually get to the liver and lung is through the bloodstream. So if you just go in and do surgery for um, this group of patients, 
um, surgery alone will not be helpful because you know you'll just be removing the tumor and then we will see new uh, new ones coming up all the time. So really, we want to know that these patients. Um, with chemotherapy, we want to control the disease first. And if surgery is feasible, for example, if there's only one lesion in the lung, one lesion in the liver, then we will consider surgery in this case um, because we know that if we uh, manage to remove all the tumors, then the outcomes can be better for this group of patients. But I think surgery alone for stage 4 cancer that has spread to the liver and lung uh, will not be recommended. Okay, Dr. Dr. Tan, Professor Tan Kirkan is uh, around already. He's um, back from his urgent surgery. So he's the head and senior consultant of our department. And I uh, would like to ask him a question by, posed by Sean Ang. What's the difference between a colonoscopy screening and diagnosis and diagnostics? Yeah, it's so sorry. Tan. Uh, I'll start. I just <laughs> so I got normal to present. Uh, many thanks for attending today's thing. Okay, so I got, I saw a few questions on scope. Lah. So all related to uh should so I answer the first one first. The difference is actually technical. Uh for the colonoscopy screening and diagnostic is because that it is how whether the individual presents for symptoms or no symptoms. So to the patient, they still go for colonoscopy, but on the back end, then the, the upside have to create a screening code or diagnostic code because that's what um, CPF now wanted. So therefore, uh, screening like what Chun Seng said is purely down to patients who have no symptom. Diagnostic means that should a patient develop rectal bleeding, then we'll try to look for a source. Okay, so that's one. Uh, could you ask the question, should we want to include gastroscopy when one goes for colonoscopy? Okay, I openly say here, there's no evidence in Singapore to show the role of gastroscopy in reducing stomach cancer. That means that it's not screening. There's no role for screening gastroscopy not found in Singapore context. It's found in the Korean context where there are higher incidence of gastric cancer, but not in Singapore. So therefore, there are a lot of patients do concurrently because of convenience, uh, because they do for the sake that they are already sedated. Yeah, so this is the reason why people do it. Yeah, I hope I answered the question. Hey, thanks, Norman. Uh, one more question for Dr. Gloria. Um, from This is a question asked by Jane. Does chem chemo does not get rid of cancer stem cells. Is it true that phytochemicals can do the job? So, um, actually, stem cells refer to cells in the body that are undifferentiated. Um, so uh, from what we understand about stem, stem cells, usually it means like, for example, a blood cell that hasn't chosen whether it will be a red blood cell or a white blood cell or, or, or a platelet type of cell. Um, so, uh, uh, that, so, so chemotherapy does get rid of cancer cells. Um, it may not uh, reduce it to a point where there is no more cancer cells, for example, in stage four cancer when there is a very, very high burden of cancer cells in the body. Um, but in, for example, stage two or stage three cancers, it is possible that um, chemo can get rid of all what we call the micrometastatic disease, so all the small cancer cells in the bloodstream. Um, and is it true that phytochemicals can do the job? So um, based on what we understand from uh, you know, years of research, so we know that uh, chemotherapy is currently the best way to manage uh, cancer. Um, I'll, I'll now move on to other questions. Uh, I think probably I'll get Professor Chong to answer some. Uh, question from Terence. For patients with polyps removed, how often should screening be done afterwards? And uh, a question from TH Fei. Are there any risks related to the screening process? And what are the potential risks? So we take on the first question first, Prof. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Norman. Uh, so after you remove a polyp, how frequent should you get the scope done? Well, it's a range. It can be anything from even one year to five years. And uh, this is uh, based on America's guidelines. It depends on a few things, whether how big the polyp is, how many polyps you have, and what is the so-called histological confirmation of the type of polyp you have. So I'm... 
unfortunately, there will, there will be too many details to go through. But the, the short answer is that if you have a very big polyp or you have multiple polyps, or the polyps are very, uh, they, they have a lot of, I would say dysplasia, means there are a lot of changes that goes close to cancer, then you kind of need to be scoped pretty early. Uh, but in general, the, the garden variety type of polyps just needs to be screened in five years' time. So then the next question is that uh, what are the risks associated with a screening colonoscopy? Uh, well, I think uh, it's been pretty much covered by uh, Dr. Petina as well, that it's pretty safe. And uh, really, the risks are minimal. Some of these risks that we commonly tell our patients include like a risk of what we call perforation, means that it's an untoward injury to the intestine and that may sound really bad and it may require even surgery, but that chance is really low. And, and this 0.1% chance uh, is frequently quoted in literature, but in our own experience, it's probably much rarer than that. The other kind of risk, uh, again, uh, like to do with bleeding or perhaps even when we do the procedure because it's done under sedation, there can be a risk of like low blood pressure. Now, this kind of risk are really uh, fairly uncommon. And most of the time, it's easily uh, resolved. Because during the scope itself, uh, you will be reassured to know that there is close monitoring. There will be oxygen given if the oxygen level is low. And there as well as uh, monitoring for any bleeding or such complications after the scope as well. So I think if I were you, I, I wouldn't be too fearful of the risk of complication to go for a scope. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Professor Chong. Uh, maybe I'll just like take a few questions as well uh, from Ku Chu. Does colonoscopy check the duodenum part? No, unfortunately not. Colonoscopy is essentially just checking your entire colon. So we will look at starting from the appendix area, and then we go all the way down to your anus. Mm. Uh, could you also ask, will PALS lead to colon cancer? Uh, PALS will not lead to colon cancer, but if you have bleeding from your, um, when you pass motion, you should get it checked as well. Because sometimes what happens is that this uh, a, a, a cancer, rectal cancer can present similar to PALS and sometimes can get misdiagnosed as PALS. And that's very unfortunate because if you go, you go along thinking that you have PALS, but actually you have rectal cancer. So if there's any bleeding, we strongly urge that you actually uh, see your colon colorectal surgeon and get screening done. Okay, uh, maybe I'll get Dr. Bettina to answer one question as well uh, from an anonymous attendee. After I've done colonoscopy, do I still have to do FIT the following year? Yeah, thank you very much. That's actually a very good question. And I think what we need to understand is what is uh, what are the, the differences between FIT testing and colonoscopy? And should people do them concurrently, meaning do both or do one or over the other? Um, the FIT testing is, uh, is the stool sampling, as we've heard earlier. Um, and because it is not quite as, as accurate, so the gold standard is the colonoscopy. The FIT testing is uh, also a recommended screening method and can be done, but this one needs to be done every year. So if you decide to go for the FIT testing, then please go and have this, uh, this or do that test once, once a year. If the test is negative, you just proceed to do another one the following year. If the test is positive, you'll get an invitation uh, to and a recommendation to go and see a doctor and arrange for a colonoscopy because if there's blood in your stool we need to find out why once you've had your colonoscopy done we usually do not recommend for you to carry on with the fit testing for at least five years if you had polyps seen during your colonoscopy we will give you a follow-up schedule to come back for a repeat colonoscopy depending on the size of the polyps the number of the polyps usually somewhere between three and five years. And then obviously you don't need to do the FIT testing in between because you're already now under the colonoscopy surveillance for your polyps. If you have a normal colonoscopy, you may decide that you want to go back onto the FIT testing because your colonoscopy was normal. And we usually advise you to start about five years after the colonoscopy to go again for annual FIT testing until such time that there might be blood in your in your stools and you come back for your colonoscopy but we wouldn't do another colonoscopy 
earlier than five years if you've had a normal colonoscopy previously. I think there was uh, one other question on uh, somebody who had a polyp removed about 10 years ago or so. Um, so that usually means you should come back to have a follow-up colonoscopy to see whether there's any more polyps. And if that polyp was removed about 10 years ago, then now would be a good time to come back and have another colonoscopy arranged. Thank you, Dr. Bettina. Uh, maybe uh, let's now tap the brains of Dr. Gloria. Uh, a question from Kit. Is there any form of chemotherapy treatment for home-based available? Looking at cancer fight, it's always a long-term one. And uh, another question from, from Kim Meng is that how long do we need chemo for stage four? How long is the estimated lifespan? Are there patients who are cured of stage four colon cancer? Okay. Uh, maybe Dr. Gloria, you can take the first question first. Okay. So regarding uh, home-based chemotherapy, so I think, uh, uh, I think it's important to know that um, in 90, more than 95% of the time when we give uh, chemotherapy for colorectal cancer, actually it's given as an outpatient. So uh, if you come to a cancer center, um, if you, there, well, there are two types of chemotherapy, like there are some oral types. So oral types definitely, they're just tablets. So you can definitely bring them home to take them. But if you need infusion chemotherapy, if this is what is recommended, then it's still given as outpatient. Um, perhaps the most inconvenient thing would be to have to come to the um, cancer center. The nurses will uh, put you on a drip. So usually it may take two to three hours, uh, sometimes longer, depending on your chemotherapy regimen. And in some cases, we give it as an infusion. So that means we connect you to the chemotherapy um, uh, 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 port, and then uh, you bring the port home. Um, and when the... Uh, medication finish, uh, is finished its run, uh, you come back and return us the bag. So um, in that sense, uh, it is home-based, but you, you still have to come to the cancer center to see the oncologist and you, you, you will need uh, some time. Um, sometimes if, if it is a drip, then you need to spend a little bit of time in the, in the, uh, um, the outpatient uh, chemo bay. Uh, and then I think there was another question about whether colorectal cancer, stage four colorectal cancer is curable. So yes, it is, but um, it depends on what kind of stage four. So remember earlier we said that stage four colon cancer just refers to um, any sort of colon cancer that has spread outside of the colon. So whether you have one um, uh, metastasis in the liver or whether you have every like cancer in the bone, in the, in the lung, in the liver, is both are considered stage four. So if we are talking about stage four colorectal cancer that has spread to the liver, and um, there's one lesion, and uh, you know, with chemotherapy and surgery, actually um, the success rates of cure is as high as about 50 to 60% in recent years. Um, and uh, how long do we need chemotherapy for? So in, in cases where we can um, kind of convert a patient from um, uh, having a spread to the liver to having no cancer seen on the CT scan, um, then usually we will suggest for about six months of chemotherapy. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, you know, so, uh, do surveillance very regularly for this group of patients. Um, and then the other group of patients whereby uh, surgery is not possible because the disease is too extensive, then, um, I mean, how long to be on chemotherapy for? Then in the purpose of chemotherapy in that case would be to try to control the disease for as long as possible, try to improve your quality of life so that you don't get so much symptoms from the cancer, but also bear in mind the uh, side effects that you may face from chemotherapy. And so then I would say that the treatment in that case will be individualized um, by if your discussion with your oncologist, depending on you know, what is important to you. Um, and all these things need to be taken into consideration when we're talking about treatment duration for stage four colorectal cancer in a setting whereby uh, we cannot uh, surgically remove all the cancer. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. Okay, we have a question to Professor Tan uh, by Kam Chui Ho. Uh, he missed your answer about gastroscopy with colonoscopy. Would you mind repeating, please? You mentioned about Korea. Uh, I mean, to tie together with uh, another question asked earlier by Ang Nan, why is there less emphasis on stomach cancer and what are the symptoms to look out for stomach cancer? Uh, Professor Tan? Uh, 
Would you like okay, to take those so, questions? So one by one. Um, so the reason why there's not a lot of emphasis on gastric cancer is because that it is the it is the number seven cancer among males and number nine cancer among females in Singapore. So the colorectal is number one in male and number two in female. So of course that the nation will focus on what is the more prevalent cancer because that adds to the cost of healthcare. So that's one. Two is that there is no role in screening. That means that if patients have upper abdominal discomfort, pain, uh, then of course that there's a role to do the concurrent gastroscopy or what people call endoscopy in the layman. Uh, but if there is no symptoms as in that, like the context of screening, then there's no role to do stomach cancer purely because of the same answer. The incidence of cancer, because stomach cancer in Singapore is not that high. Uh, and hence, it's not proven to be cost-effective. What I mean by cost-effective is that it's not worth the amount of the amount of effort to the money for equipment, manpower, system, advertising, advocacy to get people to go for scope. And uh, so that's the reason why. I need to ask one, I need to answer one more on feet. So a lot of questions on feet. Can you go for scope when you're bleeding? The answer is yes. Can you do feet? When do you do feet? Fundamentally is that the whole session is trying to reiterate that. You can do either. You don't need to choose to one as long as you're adherent. We have patients that do for feet one time and 10 years later found to have cancer. Say, I did feet before. I say, yeah, 10 years ago. So as long as you're adherent to either one of the recommendation, you should be fine. How accurate is feet? If a cancer is there, a feet should pick up 90% of the time. So the thing is that if it is fairly sensitive enough, that means accurate enough, so, so I'll leave it as that. So conclusion is that for screening means that you have no symptoms. Either way is fine. Just stick to one. You can have both. I think there are studies to say both for people who are a bit more kiasu. Uh, it's just that you end up more anxiety. Lah. But the thing is that you should stick to one. But if you have symptoms such as rectal bleeding, symptoms pain, then I suggest that you should go for a diagnostic colonoscopy. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, a question there's a question posed about whether prebiotics is recommended um, prebiotics probiotics all these are actually quite good for your gut health and probably can help with cases such as uh, irritable bowel syndrome so yes it's recommended but I don't think that's much evidence to say with, with regards to whether it prevents colorectal cancer okay so uh, yep we can go ahead and take your prebiotics and probiotics Okay, yeah, I'll direct, direct one question to Dr. Bettina. Uh, there's a question to say that if I have no symptoms and my stool test results is good, do you still recommend that I should go for colonoscopy screening? I'm 50 this year and no family history of colon cancer. Dr. Bettina, please. Um, thank you for the question. So I, I think, again, this, this uh, goes into the... Uh, the um, what are the, the similarities and the, the differences between FIT testing and, and colonoscopy? Um, if you are referring to my, my stool tests are good, so that, that seems to indicate that you have been doing the FI, FIT test. And if you are doing your FIT testing once a year and the results are negative, then you don't necessarily have to get yourself submitted for a, a colonoscopy. However, if you choose to come for a colonoscopy, you can uh, because you are above the age of 50 and that is a, is a government guideline. So you would then go and have a, a, a screening colonoscopy because you're currently asymptomatic. So either is fine. Um, as long as you're doing your FIT tests and they are negative, you will not get a referral to see a specialist for a colonoscopy. But if you decide that you would like a colonoscopy, you can walk into any polyclinic, get a referral, and see, see one of us in a restructured hospital. No problem at all. Thank you, Dr. Bettina. Okay, so uh, we have a question uh, with regards to any relation or any genetic re relation uh, for, a patient, for, for a person with a sibling with rectal cancer and another sibling with GIST. Uh, maybe Dr. Gloria would like to take this question. So um, the question is if uh, GIST is uh, genetically related to rectal cancer. So I think 
Uh, first things first is that GIST and rectal cancer are genetically different diseases. They are completely, um, they are completely different. Um, but the fact that uh, if you have a family history, um, if one of your siblings does have rectal cancer, then you will be at a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer. So usually the risk that we quote is having one family uh, member would be about two times that of the general population. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, indeed uh, GIST and rectal cancers are different. Uh, but at the same time, it is so, so important to know uh, how old was your sibling when he had a rectal cancer? Because uh, it does affect uh, the, the time of your, of your screening colonoscopy. I think that's related to another question by Jane. If I had colon cancer, does it mean that my siblings have a higher risk? Well, again, it depends on what is the age of onset that, that, that you had diagnosed with a colon cancer. So of course, generally, the younger you are, then there is more chance that it might be an inheritable or genetically associated cancer. And that also transfers to the fact that your siblings might have to get the scope done earlier. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing us with your age. Wow. <laughs> it's a, they always say right, the age is a woman's secret, but thank you. Uh, so if you're at the age of 62, uh, that, and you're the only one in your extended family that has the colon cancer, then, the, then for your siblings, if they are at the age of 50 and above, they should get one scope done. Uh, certainly, if they are younger than 50, then it's probably okay to go with the average risk individual screening. That means they don't have to get the scope done before the age of 50. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Ch uh, Prof. Chong. Uh, to direct another question to uh, Dr. Bettina. If a patient... If a pa ha having a IBD, does it connote a higher risk for colorectal cancer? How do I know I have IBD or IBS? Okay. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so IBD is inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, there are a few inflammatory bowel diseases that we, that we know of. Uh, the most common ones are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. They usually produce symptoms. Um, and most of the times they get diagnosed when you are in your, in your younger years, so not around the time where we're talking about um, coming for screening colonoscopies. So those people who have IBD usually know that they have IBD much, much younger. Um, and, um, and then part of the IBD treatment would be to go for regular colonoscopy for surveillance because we know that having IBD increases the risk of, of colorectal cancer. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome, and that is a little bit more tricky. So irritable bowel syndrome is a, um, a, a, a basically a, a basket of, of symptoms and expresses itself differently in different people. So people do get um, stomach cramps. Uh, some people get diarrhea. Some people get constipation. Sometimes it is related to eating certain things. Some patients can't really put a finger on it. Uh, there is an overlap with things like lactose intolerant, being intolerant to uh, gluten, which is celiac disease. So, or having a sensitivity to, to, to gluten can also cause these kind of symptoms. So the bottom line is in those patients, we really don't know, um, especially if patients first present with these kind of symptoms when they are in an age group where we get worried about the onset of colorectal cancer. And usually those patients will be advised to have a colonoscopy. Because you present with symptoms, this would then not be a screening colonoscopy. It would actually be a diagnostic uh, colonoscopy because you are having symptoms and we need to diagnose what the issues are. Irritable bowel syndrome itself does not have a test that says the test is positive. That means you have it. Um, irritable bowel syndrome is more a test, uh, um, um, a diagnosis of exclusion. That means we do the colonoscopy, the colonoscopy is normal. Maybe we find out by you keeping a food diary what the issues are and which foods trigger it off. And then we can tell you it's most likely irritable bowel syndrome. Maybe you should be avoiding those foods. Sometimes we never find out. It is uh, considered a functional bowel disorder. And we actually have colleagues on the physician side in the medicine department under gastroenterology 
who run specialized clinics for these kind of, of symptoms as well. And we may choose to refer you to one of them if your symptoms are relatively severe and you require medical therapy for it. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Prof. Bettina. Okay. Uh, I would like to take a few questions as well. Um, a question by um, anonymous, an anonymous attendee. If a, mm. It's a patient of age 60 plus do yearly FIT and it's normal. Does he still need to go for colonoscopy? I think it boils down as to what you really want. Uh, if you don't mind doing yearly FITs, then you can continue on that, but make sure that you do two samples on two separate days. So that will increase the accuracy. Uh, however, if you feel like you had enough of uh, poking your stools, then you can come for a colonoscopy and that will probably, uh, as what Prof. Okay. Bettina said earlier, it will probably give you five to 10 years of uh, ease of mind. Or symptomatic. Or if you are symptomatic, you know, you have bleeding, you have uh, pain, you have some weight loss, uh, or you recently realized that some family members have colon cancer, then all this will actually point to you coming to, uh, to make an appointment for colonoscopy. Okay. Um, another, uh, there's another question by Kuchu. How one decides to go for sigmoidoscopy versus colonoscopy? Will sigmoidoscopy also remove polyps if found? Thank you for your question. Um, a sigmoidoscopy is essentially a scope that is done up to the sigmoid. Sometimes we go even beyond. You can, depending on how clean uh, the, the intestines are, because in a in a colonoscopy you actually uh, prepare your intestines. You take medication laxatives the day before. There is, there shouldn't be any stools left in your colon. Whereas for a sigmoidoscopy, uh, we actually give a medication through the the anus about 20 to 30 minutes before the procedure, that only clears the left side. So we can go as high as we can, we can see. Most of the time, near the descending colon or the transverse colon, we will be met with a, a bolus of stool. So we can't really progress. Most of the time, uh, sigmoidoscopy is done for very, very young patients who present with a fresh bleeding from the, from the rectum. And we are suspecting pulse, but we just want to make sure that there's nothing really sinister proximal to that. Mm -hmm. Then we will consent for sigmoidoscopy to assess. Yeah, sigmoidoscopy also removes polyps if we find them. So we will take it out. We will send for tests, and by all intents and purposes, quite similar to a colonoscopy, but is not a complete mapping of the entire uh, large bowel. I hope that answers your question. Uh, there's a question um, by uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, his uncle on the paternal side uh, died of colon cancer at the age of 70 year old. Is, uh, is he at a higher risk compared to, to the norm, um, a normal person? Uh, probably I'll get uh, Pro Professor Tan to answer this question. Hey, hi, thanks. There's a lot of question of family history. Uh, the problem of second degree means that you know, somebody, somebody is a bit tricky because you cannot prove that. But what is generally shown is that once you have a family history, first degree means your children, your parents, your siblings, you are two times higher than the normal population. Actually, two times is not that high. Like. That means that you throw a stone outside, the chance of getting cancer in a normal patient is about 0.4% to 0.5%. So what it shows that if your parents have it, it's 1%. If your sibling have it, you're 1.5. So sibling is higher risk than parent. But second degree is too far. It means that it's very difficult to extrapolate. But if you go by the fact that your family has some degree of cancer, then my advice if someone asks me, is, then just scope. Because the thing is that once you do a scope, you clear your, all your doubts, then there's no need to be mindful anymore or concerned anymore. This is what is recommended by uh, the Ministry of Health anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Um, couple of more questions coming in. Keep them coming. We will go as, as much as we can. Uh, now I'd like to direct some questions to Gloria, Dr. Gloria. Is there any clinical trial for stage 4 rectal cancer? That's question number one. Question number two, when colon cancer is treated, what are the chances of remission? So, uh, yeah, that's an upvoted question. So, first upvote for the day. Dr. Gloria, would you like to take those questions, please? 
Yeah, sure. So the first question was uh, <coughs> about clinical trials for stage 4 rectal cancer. So yes, there are multiple ongoing clinical trials for stage 4 rectal cancer. Clinical trials actually is a, a very large, um, it is a very large basket term. Uh, clinical trials can be like a phase 1 trial where you have very, very early drug development type of trials. And then there's so phase 3 trials where by um, uh, the, the, the current uh, intervention is being compared to the standard of care. So um, there are many trials that are available for rectal cancers, ranging from the very, very early development stage, phase one to up to phase three. Um, and, and this is the only way, actually clinical trials are the only way that we can improve cancer outcomes um, in terms of um, trying to do better for our patients. And uh, sorry, the second question was about in chances of remission. Okay, so I mean, um, we, we said earlier that uh, for what are the chances of remission for colon cancer? Well, it depends on the stage. So um, we keep advocating uh, screening because we know that early stage or even pre-cancer lesions are very, very much easier to cure. So um, when we talk about cure, we mean like the patient is in remission for five years. I mean, that's the standard definition or what we understand at the moment. Um, so in terms of stage one colon cancer, we're talking about cure rates of more than 90%. So at five years, there will be no more cancer. Um, and uh, it, it, this goes down depending on uh, stage two, stage three, stage four. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. Um, Jane asked, where can she find out about these clinical trials and take part? Do you have any idea? Um, so, I mean... Most of the clinical trials for rectal cancer, I mean, it, it, if, you, if you have you've been diagnosed already with rectal cancer, then you're probably already seeing an oncologist or, um, and your doctor can then tell you, uh, you know, if you are suitable for a clinical trial. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for Prof. Bettina, um, does FIT detect later stage cancer, which started bleeding compared to colonoscopy? which can detect earlier stage cancer? Okay, thank you for that question. So the, uh, the, the whole idea about the FIT testing is uh, to detect blood in your stool. It doesn't mean that you have a cancer. It means that somewhere, either in your colon or your rectum or even in your anal canal, there is some bleeding and that shows up as blood in the stool that might you not be able to see with the naked eye, but the test can detect it. It is not specific to tell you that it is a cancer that's bleeding or that it is a polyp that's bleeding. And if you were to do an FIT test and at a time where you have very bad piles and you get bleeding from the piles, that would also make the test positive. So it is not a specific test for cancer. It just tells us that there's some bleeding in your colon. If we do a colonoscopy, we find structural abnormalities in your colon. So these structural abnormalities are cancers or polyps. And of course, um, as I said earlier, a colonoscopy is the gold standard for colonic evaluation because we can visualize the inside of your colon. So we can see a polyp that might be too small to cause any bleeding at that point in time. And hence, that is also the idea that if you go for the FIT testing, you will have to repeat it every year because at some point that polyp will be growing. And then when it gets a little bit bigger, it might actually start bleeding. And then even though you have the polyp already and it's not visible in the FIT yet, the following year you do your FIT and then there will be blood and then you're coming for your colonoscopy. So that is why we ask you to go for FIT every year because it has got a higher catch rate if you do that. Um, whereas if we ask you for, to come for a colonoscopy and your colonoscopy is normal, we tell you that polyps take some time to develop and you might be able to just come back after eight to 10 years time after normal colonoscopy. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Prof. Um, a question for, I want to direct to Prof Chong. as from an anonymous attendee. If I seek treatment only after a positive the FIT test is positive, I uh, would also like to um, direct another question to him, whether is there any new development in detecting colon cancer besides using FIT or colonoscopy? Uh, 
Okay, thanks, Norman. Uh, for the first question, is is it too late, right? After okay, so answer is that it, it, it the fit doesn't necessarily means that it's going to be a late or early stage cancer. The treatment really depends on the stage of cancer. So after anyone who is diagnosed with a colon cancer, they will have to go through a CT scan, a staging scan, and then the 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 treatment depends uh, on which stage you fall into. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you will be a, of a later stage in, in let's say, compared to colonoscopy, right? That's uh, at, at what stage of colon cancer will I likely suffer when? Uh, now again, uh, so I think I have answered that second part of the question, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you, if you do a fit and it, it comes out and it's going to be a, definitely a later stage cancer. So it just depends on at that point of time when they check. If it's a stage one or stage two, uh, then probably a surgery. If it's uh, going to be anything that is like stage four or more advanced, then it really depends on how bad the spread is and how fit is, are you for your, for your treatment. And then we will decide whether you should go for chemo, sometimes radio if it's rectal or surgery. The other part is, is there any better way to diagnose uh, cancer or detecting cancer besides fit? Well, I think it's a good question. Uh, thank you again. There are, there are many questions uh, related to this uh, developments of screening. Well, the truth is uh, if you done some reading and you look at some of these terms like what liquid biopsy and they look at like circulating DNA cells, uh, these are some of the promises of the future of screening. For now, unfortunately, none of these are really proven to be as effective or as uh, accurate that we could use compared to FIT or the scope as well. So really, uh, those are more for the future. And if you look at, uh, in terms of screening effectiveness, actually colonoscopy has achieved a pretty decent rate. It's very high, it's highly accurate. It's proven to save lives. And uh, the, the only downside with it is really about the need to drink this solution for bowel preparation. And, and other than that, it's already very, very high, uh, very highly accurate. So hence, for anything to, uh, it will take time for anything to become as good or as effective, it will really take uh, some uh, trials and some uh, use in the open market before we can say that that's equivalent. Uh, but if you do ask about other alternatives, yes, you might have heard of other things like CT scans. They use a scan for screening. It is also one of the screening methods that are presently available uh, in, in Singapore and is also recommended in the guidelines. However, again, for the details, it's best to discuss that with a doctor because there are some downsides of the scan. Namely, you can't get any tissue when you do a CT scan uh, compared to a scope where you can do both at the same time. Yep. Thank you, Prof. I'll take a few questions myself as well. Uh, Jane asks, where can I go for FIT test? So FIT test kit can be obtained at most uh, polyclinics. You can collect them, if I'm not wrong, at pharmacies as well, uh, located in Guardian or Watson's. Uh, Health Promotion Board has them as well. And in most, or rather all restructured hospitals, they should have the FIT test as well. Uh, Kuchu asks, is rectal cancer the same as colon cancer? Uh, we usually always refer to them as colorectal cancer. But rectal cancer biologically uh, is not the same as colon cancer and they behave differently. So the simple answer is that they are not the same. Okay. Uh, and uh, another question, is it necessary to select a particular doctor and hospital for colonoscopy screening? If yes, what are the criteria to consider? <laughs> um, I would say I believe in the healthcare system in Singapore and uh, any... When you, when, you, when you go for um, an appointment to see a colorectal surgeon in a, in a restructured hospital, most of the time you don't really um, get to choose a particular doctor mm -hmm. unless you are selecting them and you are private. Uh, if coming in like the most of us subsidized patients, we, we will just attend the clinic and the scope will be done by a accredited person mm -hmm. who has done many colonoscopies and rest assured the standard uh, is all right. Uh, we'd like to direct one question to Prof Tan. Uh, question by Tanya Lee. For patients who have done colonoscopy within the five years, have come across, they are still continuing with FIT yearly, even after the scope. If you have encountered a few patients with the reason that the reason for doing yearly FIT after scope is because one of the tests came back positive, even before five years. So this makes the patients even more anxious and they can't seem to not do any screening for five years. 
With this scenario, is it still ideal to advise patients to stick to colonoscopy or FIT after five years? All right, hey, thanks. So, so I, I just want to say that we cannot see the whole nation and decide that what is the one size that fit everybody. I think that that's important when we come to recommendation. When you see a doctor, we don't say that the whole nation should do so you do. We treat you. So therefore, that every context is different. So if individuals is that they come in with different recommendations, different background, different risk factors, so there may be different risks. But then it's not uncommon that patients who have fit done and then colonoscopy done go for fit. So surprisingly, there's not much data out there to suggest the role of doing fit after a normal colonoscopy, but if you have high risk features, what this shows is that you actually picked up uh, cancer polyps earlier than usual. If you still cancel and still do that, which is intuitive, right? You will pick up at a five year mark, but if you do earlier, if there is polyp, then of course you will. So that's therein lies the problem of screening. Like ladies go for a mammogram. Every time you go for a mammogram, you worry the result will show anything. Likewise, you do a stool test, everybody get anxious. Every year I do HIV because it's required. I also worry that for some reason we'll get a positive test. So likewise, every test we do, we are worried of the worst outcome. So it's intuitive. It is a known problem. So I think that it's not easy to answer that question, but it needs to be personalized. And that's the reason why that whatever that we are saying here is in the context of general population. And for most people who will conform to a certain categories that Ministry of Health has highlighted. If I go to specific, then I think that it's not for it's not appropriate for this forum to address that. Hey, yeah, thanks, Norman. Thank you, bro. Okay, uh, I'll just wipe up um wipe up with the last few questions. Uh, we, we are probably approaching the end of our Q and A segment already. Um, Kiming asks, what are the cancer markers for rectal cancer? We 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 survey these cancers with uh CEA, but we don't recommend tumor marker screening. Uh, that means doing tumor markers for a screening for colorectal cancer. Um, he also asked, does TCM help with colorectal cancer? Uh, there's so far no evidence to show that it helps with colorectal cancer. Um, it's a new question. Can FIT catch stage one colorectal cancer? Uh, FIT can, can pick it up if it's uh, sizable enough. And FIT is proven uh, two separate samples on two separate days is proven to be quite sensitive with regards to that aspect. Okay, I'll now like to ask Dr. Bettina uh, one last question, after which we will probably wrap up this Q&A segment. Uh, attendee asks, I have constipation since young. Does that increase my risk of colorectal cancer? Normally, I go to the toilet once every three days. I'm closing in 45 year old now. Dr. Bettina, please. Okay, thank you for that 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 question. So one of the uh, one of the symptoms that uh, we post out for um, possibly having issues with with colorectal cancer would be a, a change in your bowel habit. So change in your bowel habit means a variation from your normal baseline. So the uh, the issue with uh, passing motion is it is not the same for everybody. So regular bowel habit can be, I go to the toilet once a day, every day. Um, other people, I go to the toilet once every other day. And some people say I go two to three to four times every day. And that is my normal baseline. So what we're looking at is a variation of that baseline. And that is what we consider a change in the bowel habits. Um, passing motion once every three days in itself is not a risk factor for, for colon cancer. So in that particular case, if you find a variation of this, if you all of a sudden start passing motion every day, which is obviously then um, different to what it was before, that would be one of those things where we would advise you to come and see um, a specialist to consider a colonoscopy. Um, in itself, if that stays at the normal baseline, then uh, at the age of 45, um, you would not need to come in and have a colonoscopy right now. You might want to consider having one as a screening colonoscopy from the age of 50. Unless, of course, you're having any other symptoms such as bleeding from the backside when you pass motion as well. Thank you for your question. Okay, with that, uh, we, will, we have reached the end of this um, segment of the Q&A. Thank you all so much for your participation. I can see questions just coming in thick and fast. Thank you so much. Uh, we, I hope we have answered most of your queries. And uh, if you still have questions, you can still type that. We will still reply them uh, via the chat. 
please also give us your feedback at the end of this uh, um, webinar. There will be a form that pops up on your screen. It will only take about one to two minutes of your time, but it will give us a lot of information as to how we can improve this webinar for future segments. Thank you once again and have a very blessed weekend.